Hello and welcome to this interview of Will Noland with myself, Rick Bradford or William Collins, if you prefer, and Mike Buchanan of Justice for Men and Boys. Will Noland, married father of six, was for many years an English teacher, latterly at Eton. He was educated in the state system before winning a scholarship to an independent school where he enjoyed being taught well beyond the syllabus. After mentoring young offenders and teaching in a National Challenge State School, he moved to the independent sector for more freedom and to give others the opportunity that he had had. He's passionate about freedom of speech, believing it distinguishes education from indoctrination. In the summer of 2020, he came under criticism from the headmaster at Eton over a video he had made called The Patriarchy Paradox. He made the video as an input to an established curriculum item at Eton called Perspectives. This is a debating platform specific to the lower sixth form. The point of Perspectives is, or was, to provide challenging or contentious viewpoints so as to give the students something to push back against. The expectation is, or was, that they would disagree with what was presented and would deliver cogent arguments to support their contrary position. In the academic year in question, the theme of perspectives was identity. Consistent with this theme, Mr. Noland chose toxic masculinity and patriarchy as his challenging topic. His intention to, uh, to address these topics was approved. The video was produced in that context. It provides a mixture of evolutionary and sociological arguments critical of feminist patriarchy theory and presenting an alternative picture in which traditional masculinity is responsive and protective rather than oppressive and toxic. Most viewers will be familiar with this alternative to the approved narrative. Unfortunately, Many other people do not approve of presenting a positive view of masculinity. The video was posted to Mr. Nolan's own YouTube channel, as well as being uploaded to Eaton's private network, as was expected of curriculum material. But one female member of staff took exception to the video and made a complaint. The headmaster acted, supporting the complainant by asking Mr. Noland to take the video off the school site, which he duly did. However, when the headmaster also insisted the video be removed from Mr. Noland's own YouTube channel, he refused. Although he did include a disclaimer on the site, making clear that the video did not represent the views of Eton College. Despite a heartfelt letter of support from many hundreds of students, the head suspended Mr. Noland and subsequently sacked him for gross misconduct. In August this year, Mr. Noland was cleared of the accusation of professional misconduct by the Teaching Regulatory Authority. However, he's not been reinstated and, the last I heard, was pursuing his case through an employment tribunal. He's currently a private tutor. So, Will Noland, welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to talk with you. Um, can I kick off the questions um, before we get to the underlying issues themselves by asking uh, for an update on your personal position, because I know people will be interested in that. Certainly. So I had accommodation tied to the job at Eton because it's a full boarding school. So you're expected in theory to be able to work seven days a week around the clock. So they provide housing. And that meant I lost my house with the job and having to uproot a family with lots of kids and all the pets as well in the middle of the COVID pandemic was a bit difficult couldn't find anywhere to rent and I can't get a mortgage being self-employed now. I haven't got uh, long enough of the papers yet. 
So we managed to find somewhere to rent and are just taking it day by day now and then uh, waiting until we can get a mortgage from somewhere. So it's been a bit frustrating and it's one of the reasons why the legal team are questioning whether the dismissal was fair. Is it appropriate? And what about the employment tribunal? Has that happened or is that still in the future or what? That claim is lodged, but it probably won't be until 2023 or so because the, uh, the courts are so backlogged from coronavirus. So it's been a strange case in that sense, because I think in a way, uh, COVID has let Eaton off the hook slightly. It's given them much more breathing space than they otherwise would have had. But I think personally, all that will happen in the interim is that the college will move further in its current direction of travel. And uh, that will be interesting to see. Mm, I can see you're as pessimistic as me. Um, what about um, the private tutoring? Is that going well? Are you fully occupied? Yeah, that's going very well. Um, I knew before I got sacked from Eton that there was a strong market for private tutoring. And in that sense, I wasn't worried about losing my job because I felt that there were developments at Eton over the last few years that were making me slightly concerned about the future of the institution. So it would be best to start to prepare perhaps for looking elsewhere anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think we're going to get to the issue of homeschooling in the questioning. But Mike, over to you. Yes, thank, thank you, Rick. Um, Will, hi. It's, it's wonderful to meet you uh, after, after this time. Um, I, I first became aware that there was a serious problem at Eton when the odious feminist Laura Bates was invited to speak to the boys about toxic masculinity. This is the odious woman behind um, the Everyday Sexism Project, or as we call it, the Everyday Whining Project. Um, and I, I was just dumbstruck um, that Eton, uh, you know, of, of all schools, could 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 invite this 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 awful woman in to talk to the boys. And I think about toxic masculinity of, of all things, just extraordinary. Um, go woke, go broke, they say. Um, do you think the now well-advertised wokeness of Eton is going to impact on the number of people willing to send their sons there? Good question. The, the waiting list for places at Eton is so long because the brand's so well-established that I'm sorry to say I don't think it will impact applications much, but I think it will fundamentally change the nature of the applications and also change the nature of the institution. There are a lot of families who have been associated with the college for many generations who are very upset at the response the college had to the video. So I think there is something at the heart of Eton that has really been put under the spotlight via my case. And is it the case that throughout Eton, it's mainly been about the networking of the students? Is that the point of boarding school, getting to know people and forging relationships for later life, possibly, in which case some of the fundamental changes to the way education is being delivered there might not have as big an impact as you'd expect but it's certainly not going to be the same place. Um, there are lines you can cross where I think there are points of no return and saying that curriculum content gets blocked if one person gets upset is certainly one of them. Right, rather distressingly, uh, Will, I, 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 I got the impression that most news outlets rather approved of your sacking. Um, perhaps that's because the media is largely a lost cause. Um, but really confusingly, some of them likened you to an incel, which is a rather odd comparison for a married father of six, I have to say. But I, I suppose <laughs> any slur will do. And an article in The Spectator said that your video repeatedly says that women use their sexuality to their advantage. Sh uh, shocking, Mr. Nolan, shocking. How do, how do you plead? This is what I found strange about a lot of the news commentary on the case. The Times um, ran the headline saying that Eaton was trampling on the freedom to think. So I think they did see the principle that was at stake. But even the journalists who were 
broadly in support of the idea of freedom of speech, still thought it was appropriate to somehow just dismiss the arguments in the video as not worthy of consideration. And sorry, but the idea that um, females of all species use their sexuality to get males to do things for them is fairly standard evolutionary biology. Darwin uh, split it into the, the, the choosy female and the competitive male. And this is largely how the world works. And if you don't like it, then sneering at it's not going to change it. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's just baffling when you, you say things that you think are, you know, beyond any scientific question. And, and then you get that sort of pushback. Mike. Will, is it true that prefects at Eton were obliged to wear waistcoats in Black Lives Matter livery? And if so, um, you were doomed as soon as you made your video, really, weren't you? <laughs> uh, there's an element of, I think, being doomed just for taking a particular stance on some topics, not necessarily because the arguments themselves are problematic, but even raising any kind of argument against it whatsoever is disallowed. And the boys weren't obliged to wear the waistcoats. It was slightly more sinister than that. There were waistcoats produced for all of them in the prefect group um, without them being requested. And the expectation was that they would wear them. And it takes quite a strong-minded student to be presented with one of these with the expectation it's going to be worn and then to say, no, I won't be wearing it, even though most of your peers are, because teenagers generally like to fit in. So they weren't obliged to wear them, but it was certainly a heavy expectation. Yeah, it's called moral coercion, isn't it? And I think moral coercion is being employed all over the place. My goodness, it's a plague. And uh, Now, this issue of privilege, I know a phenomenon that it's the centres of genuine privilege, which have adopted wokery most ardently, not, not just Eton, but Oxford and Cambridge are notable as well. So do you think this betrays the sly hidden agenda that wokery is actually the elite's latest stratagem for maintaining their power? Have these institutions, and indeed the people within them, hit upon a clever way of distracting attention from their privilege by giving themselves a gloss of social loveliness? I mean, it's notable, for example, that wokery entirely ignores economic disadvantage and the working class generally. The fall of the Red Wall is testament to the working class having finally realised that Labour and the Lib Dems represent middle class wokesters and have nothing to offer them. Do you think I'm on the right lines here or, or do you have a, a different view on that? No, I, I think that analysis is broadly correct and it also is consistent with the history of wokeism and its roots in Marxist ideology, because if you are going to try to enforce equality, which is one of the aims of wokeism, equality or equity, depending how you put it, then you're going to have to have a group of people who have the power to do that. And that's why you end up with communist governments having a small ruling class of elites who certainly aren't equal to everybody else. And I think a common misconception with the woke agenda is it's somehow a small group of revolutionaries who are rising against the power of these great institutions and threatening them. I think it's actually largely about a, a couple of people at the top of the institutions who are sympathetic to the agenda. And then the place is rot from the head down and more and more appointments are made consistent with the vision. And then slowly it filters through the entire thing and then they are lost. Is that ideological opinion what we're truly up against here? That was a very curious objection to the video. And my response to it was that one problem with a world without men would be that reproduction would cease and the human species would cease to be. But that didn't seem to be a good enough explanation. <laughs> so the other point I raised was that... Uh, the vast majority of deaths in the workplace are men. And if there were no men, then the only people left to be doing these dangerous, dirty jobs that often lead to death 
would be women. And it would be awful for women to have to die on the job. So that's another reason a world without men would be terrible. But then the response to that was, are you saying that women are biologically incapable of doing these jobs, like deep sea mining, fishing, whatever it might be? And uh, no, I'm sure they are capable of doing it, but the, the men obviously find it difficult enough because they die very often too. So it didn't seem to be a, a coherent objection to me. But yes, I think fundamentally there is something um, at the root of this about masculinity itself being a problem that has to be uprooted and disposed with. Uh, a naive agenda, to put it mildly, because this is something that's been shaped by women's choices over millions of years of evolution. So men are the way they are as a result of sexual selection, not natural selection. So it's it's comical in the way if you look at it, if it weren't so tragic. Yeah, abso absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we are the result of a, a, a female spec for breeding yeah. for breeding men, and in the past they they wanted to breed Dobermans, and now they've they changed their spec to King Charles Spaniels. But you can't, <laughs> you know, it doesn't change overnight. Does well, it? I, I'm not even sure it's the, the female spec has changed. I think there's a a new political spec for what a man is supposed to look like, but mm. Um, women still prefer more masculine, more dominant men around the time of ovulation. That hasn't changed. No. The the basic structure of the human female is the same as it was in the Stone Age. Yeah, that's right. It's it's all terribly ironic. Uh, just coming back to Eaton then, in, in the pu pupil's open letter, they claimed that the headmaster had told them that anything that can be deemed hostile by a single member of one of the school's designated minority groups will be censored. If this is truly the headmaster's ruling, is he knowingly implementing limitless intolerance, a tyranny of, by the victimhood, or, or is he just incredibly naive? Well, what's a, a minority group? Because you could have a situation where a, uh, a white, conservative christian married male is a minority <laughs> and no mr nolans <laughs> if if he if he finds an idea offensive does that mean that the curriculum content gets blocked i highly doubt it no. so the idea of having to police ideas to create a safe space for protected groups of staff immediately raises questions about what kinds of ideas are protected and why and once you start looking at it that way, you see that the safe space is really just a Trojan horse to allow some ideas that can't stand up in debate to be protected. Yeah. So it's all just a, it's all, do you think it's all a cynical ploy then? Is, do, you, do you err on that side rather than just the result of stupidity and naivety? I think it's a, a mixture of cowardice on the one hand and being worried about the attacks that might come from allowing somebody to be offended and telling them, sorry, this is just part of having serious discussions about ideas. Sometimes our deeply cherished beliefs or worldviews get questioned in ways we find uncomfortable and having to say that it matters more to have the rigorous pursuit of intellectual inquiry than it does to have everyone feeling great about themselves the entire time. You get criticized for that kind of stance. And then I think there's an element of being uh, deeply sympathetic to some of the viewpoints that these people who complain that they've been harassed if they get challenged in debate uh, themselves hold. Yeah. Will, uh, um, people talk about a crisis of masculinity, uh, but is it a crisis of masculinity or a crisis of society's attitude towards masculinity? It's a good question. Depends what we mean by society's attitude, because there's no such thing as society over and above just individual people. To, to see it as a, a concrete entity in its own right would be to, to reify an abstraction. So I would say that if you look at the average woman still, and most women don't identify as feminists, if you look at what surveys suggest, there's an often overlooked fact, mm. then I think there still is a genuine appreciation for traditionally masculine men. I think most women, when push comes to shove, will prioritize their families over their careers 
And that's the ultimate explanation for the so-called gender wage gap. And that means they do still want male providers. And if you look at what happens in divorce, it, the picture's clear too there. So uh, a husband having um, income insecurity or job insecurity is one of the main predictors of divorce because women want that financial security. So that still sounds very much like the traditional family setup with the male provider. And that is what most women still want. So what is this society then, which is having a problem with attitude to masculinity? I would say it's the chattering classes. It's, it's the media, it's the newspapers, it's the academics, many of whom are removed from some of the more basic demands of day-to-day -day life and like to experiment with ideas that they have the luxury of playing around with. But when they actually come back down to earth with more working class people tend not to work very well. In other words, it's an idea so stupid, you'd have to be an intellectual to believe it. That's a wonderful expression. Yeah, there are some mistakes you have to be quite clever to make and you have to be able to rationalize some of the obvious mistakes away in the way that the average person wouldn't need to because they wouldn't ever fall for it in the first place. So, so what do you think lies behind this very evident attack on masculinity then? What, what, is the, what, what purpose is it serving? Well, if you think about the impact it has on the family, I think that's one of the key places to look, given that the, the family is the core social unit. Traditionally, the ideas about men as protectors, providers, have been ways of integrating men into the structure of families and therefore integrating them into wider society. And men tend to work harder and work better when their work, which is often dirty and dangerous and in some ways demeaning, is ennobled by the fact that they are doing it for their wives, for their children. And when you take that away from men and you fragment the family structure, then that weakening of the family unit means that people will tend, I think, to become more atomized and then they will look to the state. They will look to big institutions for that sense of security and safety the family used to provide. And I would suggest that ultimately that's what we're seeing. So the more radicalized women become, the more feminist, the more likely they are to, broadly speaking, vote left wing politically. Um, ironically, the, the patriarchy that they turn to, no longer the individual male as the head of the family, but it is the grand patriarch of the state, the, the single mother provided for by the state instead of the husband. So I'd, I would say that weakening the family structure is a way of increasing dependence on state power. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, ironically, what, what the feminist movement had done is, is, is undermined the individual patriarch and created a super mega patriarch in the form of the state. Yeah, that's a profound point because the, the, the thing that got a lot of the journalists who, who had a go at trying to engage with the arguments in the video um, in The Spectator, for example, they didn't like the fact that I pointed out that the canonical position of evolutionary anthropology is there's never been a matriarchy. No, there now, isn't. The, the, the reason for that is um, one would be contrary to nature. If you think about the basic makeup of human beings, um, men can't breastfeed. Uh, men can't get pregnant. Men can't give birth. There's never been a society where men have been the primary caregivers of young infants. It just wouldn't work. There's never been a society where women have been the primary protectors or, or warriors. You wouldn't want too many women dying in warfare because if you lose too many women, your uh, population can't repopulate after war. You can lose lots of men and a few can get the job done just fine and probably enjoy doing it. So we've got um, the choice isn't between patriarchy or no patriarchy. It's just between what kind of patriarchy you're going to have. There's never been a matriarchy and never will be. And we're finding that out now. And it's just shifted towards the, the state supplanting the traditional male role. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I try pointing this out to people saying, well, there is no empirical evidence that a, uh, the sort of society that feminism ostensibly wants to build, i.e. sort of matriarchy of, of sorts, can even exist. 
I mean, we don't have a science of sociology which is sufficiently sophisticated to examine that question theoretically and come up with an answer. But what we do know is the history of anthropology is there's never been one. So therefore, there's no reason to believe what they're trying to do is even possible. And the fact that the fact that our populations are now dying out <laughs> sort of indicates that it isn't. But we dying have out, and then the the fertility rates of um, the what they would call uh, the most toxic forms of patriarchy in Islam, for example, uh, they're far from dying out. The fertility rates there are high. If you look at the fertility rate in Africa, it's dwarfing Europe and America. So, in in a in a very real fundamental sense, this feminist ideology is leading to the very cultures promoting it just being outbred, to put it bluntly. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Well, Will, I'm, I'm reminded of a point I first encountered in Steve Moxon's amazing book, The Woman Racket, which was published in 2008, that um, a huge number of women in the UK and elsewhere are financially dependent on, on, on male taxpayers primarily because men pay three quarters of the tax. Um, so, uh, and so they're financially dependent on men that they wouldn't touch with a barge pole as partners. So, so there's a certain irony there in the feminist dream, isn't there? I see that the Great Men Good Lad organization has rebranded itself as Beyond Equality. And their message is stated on the website, I quote, boys won't be boys, they'll be what we teach them to be. I think it's fair to say that that is overt social engineering. Um, is the purpose of undermining masculinity to make the masses compliant, starting with the more bolshy ones, the men? I suspect there is an element of trying to break the people who might be the strongest resistance. So it wouldn't surprise me. And that phrase that boys will be whatever we want them to be is both shockingly arrogant and shockingly naive. Firstly, because there's, there's no intellectuals vision that is so great that humanity needs to be remolded after it i think people should have learned the lesson of that from the body count of marxism sadly they seem not to have done though and then also you are trying to change something that goes back far further and goes far deeper than any of your superficial understandings or, or visions of it i think human nature isn't infinitely malleable it can't be just putty in the hands of intellectual radicals so they'll be disappointed eventually it just depends how much misery people are going to have to go to until this current phase reaches its end well, is, is the real problem that in, in the face of the destructive aspects of feminism, men have become cowed? Is the real problem that men have been weak? The problem is actually a dearth of robust masculinity rather than its excess. I think that's a, a big part of it. And one of the things at the, at the root of the feminist movement that is in my opinion often overlooked is that when women don't have much economic and political power they tend to guard sex as a resource uh, very strongly and men have to work very hard to gain access to sex and become marriage material that traditionally has been the main motivator for men pursuing education and pursuing careers because they want to acquire status as a proxy for signaling they'll be good providers and good, um, good husbands. So I think that uh, one of the things that happened with the sexual revolution is that men realized that the more liberated women became economically, politically, the easier it was for them to get sex from women. And many men were very keen to make the most of this. And partly it's a, as Dr. Stephen Baskerville has put it, it's, it's a, it's a honey trap. And when men fall into that, then they soon find that the traditional setup no longer really works. That's what we're finding now. 
and nature abhors a vacuum. And we're seeing that that vacuum of male leadership, male authority is being fulfilled, as we discussed earlier, by the state instead. There has to be one. And because of the realities of childbirth and child rearing, women aren't going to be the um, primary providers, at least for that period of their lives. So whether it's single men paying taxes, but not integrated into families, or whether it's just the state more broadly speaking, that's what stepped in to fill the void. And men who think that uh, they very recognized cowardice in themselves, but think it's best to keep quiet because there'll be some kind of happy ever after if they do, even if it's just in the short term, I think we'll find out that, that that's a mistaken path to take. Things will only escalate. Will, the ever quotable John Stuart Mill had this to say about state education. A general state education is a mere contrivance for molding people to be exactly like one another. And as the mold in which it casts them is that which pleases the dominant power in the government, whether that be a monarchy or, or aristocracy or a majority of the existing generation, in proportion as it is efficient and successful, it establishes a despotism over the mind, leading by a natural tendency to one over the body. End of, end of uh, quotation. Will, do you, do you think that Mill's 1867 words fit the case today? I, I do think they broadly fit the case today. And if you think about the fact that state education and certainly the state monopoly on education is actually a relatively recent development. And for the vast majority of human history, education was largely centered on the family or on tutors working within the family, independent of the state sheds a new light on some of the developments we're seeing now, where the state is not just responsible for academic education, but once it's got a taste of that, it's starting to reach further and further into other areas of students' lives as well, whether it's about telling them how to exercise or what to eat or how to enjoy their free time. You have to, at some point, recognize that the primary educator of children is always going to be the parents and it's good to see more parents getting more involved with what's going on at school in the u.s at the moment for example you can see some of the videos of parents on school boards questioning the teaching of critical race theory we've seen in birmingham some of the muslim parents protesting against the lgbtq ideology in primary schools and the more of that we can get, the better. Uh, if people as parents step away from schools and just assume that the school knows best, then it just will snowball and the schools will want more and more and more because the state, again, is responding to a, a vacuum of parental leadership. Because my impression is um, that state education, sending, sending your child into state education now is virtually child abuse, it seems to me. So, so what is the future? Is the future homeschooling or what? If you look at the current data on the state of teaching and education, the government has failed to meet its recruitment targets for teachers for something like the last 10 years in a row. And more and more teachers are leaving as well. So it's not just a recruitment crisis, it's also a retention crisis. And many of them are citing stifling ideological environments as the reason. You've also got homeschooling on the rise relatively rapidly in the UK. And the tutoring business as well has also received a fairly significant boost from COVID because Many parents have actually seen for the first time in any kind of detail what lessons are really like because they might be getting on with some work in the background and they hear what's happening online. So I think more people are becoming dissatisfied with the traditional school setup. So I don't think things will go back to the way they were pre-pandemic. And one of the things we're likely to see is a bit more decentralization and smaller institutions being set up and also i think more and more tutoring will um what difference do you think your stand has made or will ultimately make can one person stand against this concerted cultural attack 
I think it's safer if lots of people stand against it. The analogy I like to use is that if you watch the nature documentaries when the wolf pack tries to attack the bison, if all the bison just turn and face, then the wolf won't even try. If they run, then the wolf will go and pick off the weakest ones first. So I think if more people start to at least question it or say, this is absurd, we can't start canceling debate just because one person's upset, where does that lead logically? Then we could stop it in a day. But people are worried about losing jobs, for example. And if you do stick your neck above the parapet, then you need to have uh, a thick one and then walk away from it. What's the ultimate solution? Hopefully, if more and more individuals start doing the kind of thing that I did, then more people will have the confidence to do something similar, and then we'll reach a kind of critical mass where you've got enough people at least trying to resist that it won't be worth trying to impose this kind of agenda anymore. So, Will, final question. Do you, do you regret your video now? Are there times when you wish you'd kept your head down and been a good, obedient boy? Or, do, <laughs> or does personal integrity triumph overall? The, uh, the assumption underlying that question is uh, an interesting one because it assumes that there would have been a happy ever after if I had taken the video down. Now, I don't believe that for a second. I had had numerous resources blocked over the years at Eton. It wasn't just that video. It was basically anything challenging the politically correct narrative on a number of topics that I care deeply about. So that kind of environment, unless you resist it, starts to infect you. And it would be very bad for me psychologically to have to work in that kind of place every day not speaking my mind. That isn't a career worth having. And the other assumption is that I suppose it's all about money. And if I'd taken the video down, I'd still be getting paid the Eton salary. But any teacher who's in the job for money has made a big mistake in the first place. If you can do something for money, go and be an investment banker or something where the money's actually worth sacrificing your integrity for. In teaching, no. So no, I don't regret it. And I think that integrity does matter more than selling out. There's no amount of money you could pay me to impose that kind of atmosphere on classrooms at Eton. It could have been the headmaster's salary and it still wouldn't have been worth it. The other point is that I was being investigated whether I took the video down or not. So I preferred to leave it up so everybody could see what it was I was being investigated for. Otherwise, it would have all been done in the dark, which would have been, I think, their dream. Will, I haven't been in a school since the world was a very different place. Is the education system, indeed the culture generally, teaching girls to despise and fear men and teaching boys to be self-loathing? Have self-loathing men now become a contagion? What I found curious um, at Eton and at other schools is that often you find uh, female teachers being more willing in some cases to make a stand for traditional male virtues and values than many of the male teachers are. Now, whether that's because the male teachers think they're going to get a brownie points for being cowed to the orthodox feminist narrative i'm not sure but the lack of male role models for male students is certainly a problem that's only getting worse if you look at the number of men in teaching particularly at the secondary school level there are lots of boys who i think sorely need a strong male role model particularly in some of the most challenging schools in the country who aren't getting one and you see similar problems when this is a, another offensive point to make, but you see similar problems with boys being raised by uh, single mothers. So I do think that the, the lack of strong male teachers is related to lack of strong male um, leadership in the home as well. 
Yeah, these things are all all sociologically related. That's that's the problem. Um, here's here's a quote from your May interview that you had with Hannah Gal, which uh, I think I think you might have been borrowing from Rob Dreyer. The the pitter patter of woke tears is no different from the stomping of brown shirts boots. Their reaction to the patriarchy paradox is the clearest proof of their agenda. The flack only gets heavy when you're over the target. Discuss. Yeah, that's uh, that's Dreyer's book, Live Not By Lies. And it, I think it actually goes back itself to uh, Karl Popper in The Open Society and Its Enemies when he talks about people bringing um, basically pistols and fists to arguments instead of words and you've got people who refuse to debate and just want to shut down discussion and tolerance shouldn't be extended to them because they are themselves intolerant now there's a sense in which getting the flack when you're over the target is an indication of what you're not really allowed to talk about you you find out what the invisible tripwires are as it were only by walking over them and i found it amusing that that had happened at an all, all boys school um, regarding the topic of masculinity. And people felt that agenda was in the air and the video really revealed it very clearly. Now, is there a, a solution to this other than people just accepting that it really is use it or lose it and you have to make these counterpoints to the accepted narratives, otherwise the narrative just become more entrenched? I suspect so. And again, I think this is to do with people in some sense ultimately getting what they deserve. If these institutions are allowed to run along these kinds of lines because no one really cares enough to try to change the course, then, of course, that's what's going to happen. Will, talking of Rob Dreyer, you haven't committed the further sin of being a Christian, have you? Yes, and I think that was another way in which the video was problematic because these things are, are linked. So patriarchy in the view of the male as the natural leader of the family and of society, that goes back to the idea of natural law and there being some kind of human nature that's fixed. And there are links between patriarchy in human society and monarchy with the king as the overarching patriarch of the whole family of society, and then beyond that as well to God as the father with the capital F. So in some ways, I think there's a strong connection between the attack on patriarchy, as most people hear about it in the press and in educational institutions, and the attack on religion. So... God as the supreme father or patriarch is arguably the main target here. And of course, that was the case for Marx as well. And the destruction of the family and the destruction of the Holy Family were intimately linked for him. And the radicals had religion in their sights. Will Nolan, thank you very much for your time. It's been a delight to talk to you. And um, I have to say you've made a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to speak with you both.